Do you want to say a few words before we start introducing our first speaker? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, I would like to thank James and the rest of the team that is handling uh, this seminar uh, series and did a wonderful job uh, last year, actually. Uh, and uh, as you have seen, we are experimenting different formats, modalities, and you know, this uh, event today uh, tries to come back to, let's say, a flavor that we used to uh, try to, to instillate, let's say, in our meetings. The meetups, if you recall, in the past uh, would be mostly about uh, you know, meeting together and, and discussing together about relevant topics uh, in this area with multiple speakers and uh, with this particular attention to uh, include, let's say, everyone into the discussion and have a, a large uh, discussion at the end uh, of the three different uh, uh, topics uh, that will be, that are grouped somehow in a, in a singular umbrella, in this case, uh, continue learning at the edge. So let's hope that this is uh, one of the first uh, uh, of those uh, meetups uh, that uh, we are organizing every few weeks uh, or every month. I don't recall, James, what was the <laughs> time that we, we decided, but let's say, um, uh, less events, but uh, more uh, focus on uh, open discussion, okay? And uh, even uh, socializing at the end. So I hope this uh, would be a nice uh, comeback, let's say, of that uh, uh, kind of uh, events that we organized in the past and uh, people actually enjoyed. So uh, let's have some fun and I hope you will enjoy it or we join us as well in the next uh, meetup. So James, if you want, you can uh, maybe introduce the, the speakers and, and uh, the, the event overall as we planned it today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that forward, Francesno. And I already think this has been a success given we have uh, much higher in-person participation. But as, as he said, uh, we're open to new ideas. So if you have any feedback or suggestions for speakers, please reach out. Um, so the way this will work is we have three wonderful talks today. Um, each of those talks will have around 15 minutes of talk plus five minutes for some questions. When we're done with all three speakers, uh, then we will we'll have, we'll go back again for uh, general questions to the speakers and try and just blend into some community discussion where everyone should feel free to unmute, turn your camera on and say something back and forth. Um, we will try to change the meeting time every month for this. Uh, I think right now it's a little or very late in Asia. We'll try and change it up so that everyone has a comfortable time to join each month. Great. So um, with that being said, we'll start with Yavin Wang. Uh, I believe you're a PhD student you see here at uh, Jun Jiatong University. Um, he will be discussing his NURPS paper, S prompts, learning with pre-trained transformers and Occam's razor for domain incremental learning. And we are uh, very happy to have you lead us off today. So I guess go ahead and take it away. You're muted right now. Yeah, man. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I'm glad to talk about paper as Tom's learning with pre-trained transformers, uh, common reason for domain for learning. So, uh, equipment learning or continuing learning is a research area that aims to enable machine models to learn from a data stream by leveraging previous learned knowledge. It may provide a path towards more human like AI. So, one of the most popular continuing learning tasks is the class in human learning, where models are incorporating the knowledge of new classes incrementally and build a universal class fairs among all same classes. But uh, in our work, we are focusing on the domain for learning, where classes are keep the same, but the involved domains commonly vary a lot in sequence. And we find that the large domain gaps will result in more severe forgetting problem. So domain of learning is also a challenging task, but uh, currently this setting is not well studied. Oh, sorry. So what? What's the forgetting and what causes it? As shown in this figure, in continuing learning models transfer to learn new knowledge based on a set of shared widths that includes the old knowledge. Uh, nevertheless, this sharing is very likely to result in a knowledge creation on the old tasks, since the shared widths are meaning to fit the new task regardless of the old knowledge. The knowledge degradation uh, is known as a catastrophe forgetting. But uh, there are some strategies designed to overcome such problem. 
for example, we can replay all the training data or regularize the update of parameters. But uh, some methods also expand the network parameters to the new tasks. And uh, we found that these methods just keep a fragile balance between stability and plasticity, and they fail in the dilemma. Uh, it's a deeper problem of forgetting. In, if we optimize our model with our new task, we can have a hazard plasticity, but uh, this will cause a forgetting of past task. But we'll, we fixing all this, we can have the hazard stability, but the, this will hinder us the learning of new tasks. Uh, especially in domain learning, uh, it's very difficult to maintain the balance as the domain gaps will result in more severe forgetting. Uh, we think the reason causing this problem is simple. It is accumulating knowledge in a set of shallow widths or in a single model. Uh, it's just like a tug of war in which one size gains is equivalent to the other size loss. So in our paper, we propose a loop breaking paradigm as prompts for example free domain learning. And uh, we support as called paradigm for pure image models such as vision transformers, VIT, uh, and uh, language image models such as Clip. So the key idea of SPOMS is to learn knowledge independently across domains so that the model can achieve the best for each domain. Uh, SPOMS is able to generate a feature space where each subspace is spanned by one single domain and all the subspaces are this overlap. This will lead to no forgetting cross domains and play a winning game for domain learning. So how to learn domain knowledge independently uh, we use prompting. Prompting is a prompt tuning strategy, which is a good parameter efficient and data efficient uh, transfer learning paradigm. Uh, as shown in this figure, uh, prompt tuning just needs to tune a small number of parameters in a model's input space so that the pre trained model can transfer to learn new tasks easily. Uh, it's a good choice under the human learning background because we don't want to add too much memory during the learning. Uh, there are two important literatures inspired us. Uh, one is the learning to prompt for continuous learning, and, and the other is prompt tuning. So at prompt, our response is very simple and uh, clear. Uh, at points, we'll learn from domain by domain independently and uh, with the pre-trained transformers. Uh, we merely tune the current domains Related prompts and the classifiers during the learning. Uh, the uppercase S is the total number of the domains. Uh, thus, we name our methods as prompts. Uh, that, that's our name. So, after each domain, we will save the prompts in the memory, which we call the prompts pool. And we also save the classifiers in the classifier pool because these two parts only have few parameters and uh, our method does not need uh, much memory space. Uh, as we will have multiple prompts after learning, this re requires a domain identifier for inference. Uh, we just apply a key means to get the centers of each domain during training. I don't know that key means is performed on the feature space of the fixed pre-trained transformers without using any prompts. So the inference types are detailed in this figure. We use KN to search for the nearest centers of the given test image feature to identify the correct uh, domain during the inference. The, the inference process is similar to L2P, but uh, the task identifier of L2P is learnable during the learning, but our identifier is of each domain is fixed. Once we get this, uh, our, we think our strategy is more suitable for domain learning because since the learnable domain task identifier, we also have forgetting problem. Uh, and uh, the domain learning is have a severe forgetting. So, and our methods is simple and effective for domain learning. Moreover, we also apply 
as Pom's strategy for language and image models. And uh, we also explored a uh, brand new language image prompting scheme, uh, SLI Pom's. In this case, we use Clip, a uh, famous multimodal vision and uh, language model as our base model. Uh, Clip has grown to have great transferability and uh, promising real short classification accuracies. And we think such multimodal is a better choice for instant learning as it is better, it has better generalization and transfer learning ability. So the key idea is to prompt the pair of language and image transformers simultaneously with a pair of learnable language and image prompts at the two ends. Uh, this, this highly enhanced clips, clips the transfer learning ability on a variety of domains. Besides, the training and inference steps are the same as the aforementioned the VIT based uh, as points. Okay, uh, that, that, that's two points. Well, finally, we conduct the extensive experiments on three large domain colonial benchmarks. Um, experiments show that the proposed as points gets the state of the art uh, performances. Uh, since many people may not be familiar with the setting of domain learning, I will briefly introduce these six steps. Uh, first, the CDD is a distance for continuous deep trick detection, uh, which can be seen as a binary classification task. Uh, we stack the most changing track. This track requires learning on five sequential deep fake detection domains. And uh, core 50 is a uh, where they use this as for continuous object recognition, it have 50 categories from 11 distinct domains. This size uses eight domains for input learning and uh, the data for the rest are as the test set. Uh, domain letter is also a widely used this size for domain input learning. The setting of this set is the same as CDD, but it has 345 categories. So the main results are on CDB sites. Our clip with the SPOMS obtains a considerable relative improvements over the other methods in terms of both accuracy and forgetting. And uh, for perfectly, SPOMS all performs other methods around 14% improvements. And for Dominant, SPOMS all performs other methods around 33 improvements. In our operation study, we studied the effect of the number of k-means centers, which is uh, one of the most important hyperparameters of SPOMS. Uh, we found SPOMS works very stable for different k values. This study performed on CVB, but uh, we also conduct, we also use k equals to five in other experiments, uh, which means that we will select five centers for each domain as domain identification. Sure. Oh. We also study the effect of the number of neighbors when we do KNN search. For this result, we can find that the one N works better than the other cases, but uh, the impact is not great. So, therefore, we suggest using one N that searches the nearest domain at the fair because this is simple and uh, effective for our response. We also use TSN to visualize the features retrieved by the pre clip and the clip with our prompts. We found that the S prompts actually results in a clear domain separation compared to the other pre trained models. Uh, to our surprise, the domain identification accuracies are not so high using either VIT based or clip based features, as strong as this figure. This, this, this table, which means that in many cases, as prompts use the wrong prompts and classifiers to do classification, but it gets the correct prediction. It means that the proposed as prompting is not fundamentally influenced by the domain identification. The success of our methods may also benefit from the generation proved by the prompt tuning or the pre trained models. Uh, we then study the generation of the proposed as forms on unseen domains. In other words, uh, out of domain data. We can say the accuracy of the three 
out of domain data increased fairly as isoforms is trained on more things data. Even if the model is not trained on certain domain, the model still has the ability to, to do per, per prediction on this domain. The reason of success of response may be the good domain identification with the excellent generalization. So that, that's our conclusion. So in summary, the main contributions includes a rule breaking learning paradigm response to play a one game for domain learning. And we also propose a new paired language and image forming scheme to enhance clips transfer learning ability. Uh, to, our, to our best knowledge, it is the first time to introduce in the paired language and image prompting scheme in the literature. So our code is publicly available, and uh, we also collect uh, some documents, papers, codes, and uh, talks about continuous learning in the repository below. Okay, thank you. That's all. Great, great. Thank you so much. Um, and now we have time for uh, questions. So if anybody has a question they want to ask Yavin, please, uh, uh, I guess, turn your camera on and or unmute and you can go ahead and ask. Maybe raise hands, if that's easier. Um, and I'll go ahead and start with one if nobody else does. Yeah, so I want to hear, I guess, insight. Um, I, I remember reading your paper and you kind of talked on this that, oh, Oh, Ali, you have a question. You go ahead. <laughs> uh, it's okay. You can go. I'll ask after you. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. I just wondering if you could talk yeah. about like uh, how maybe. Uh, am I correct that you you said that you don't really work well on on class incremental learning? Was that correct? You haven't. Oh, uh, so you said that your say, method uh, does uh, not work. As opposed to perform passing learning. Yes. Uh, as opposed to can perform passing uh, learning. Uh, that is, um, actually, as forms count to custom inquiry, and uh, we try to apply this this paradigm to custom inquiry because uh, for custom inquiry, um, one important problem is the class imbalance problem, and uh, in our paradigm uh, that we we just uh, learn independent class pairs, and we can we cannot right. solve this class imbalance problem. Uh, yeah, and we. Just wondering if there's a way to take away. A, you think you could try and I mean, you think there's a way it could be modified, like using clip classification or a different type of classifier. I think that could be cool. Um, and so, so yeah, yeah. you could do a more general continual learning where you have different types of shifts. Yeah, yeah. That. Uh, Ali, yeah, you can yeah, go. We ask you to try and do more general inquiry scheme, but uh. In the end, this work we just uh, study the domain learning. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for a great talk, Yami. Um, yeah, I just have a quick question. Like, um, did you, or maybe I missed it from the talk? Um, did you check like where the performance gain? Because you have a huge gain on like performance from other models. So, do you know where your performance gain is coming from in your model? Is it coming from your pre-trained? image transformer, or is it from your k-means and can and technique? Like, where is that coming from? Yeah, yeah, we, we conduct a Bayesian study in our main paper, but uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm not putting this in the PT, but uh, in the stats, um, the main contribution the from the accuracy is, is the separation of home learning. Uh, we learn knowledge independently across domains. So, so that uh, we can perform best for each domain. And uh, the second uh, important thing is that uh, the generalization ability. Uh, yeah, the clip based model it has strong generalization. Uh, even if you can see th this is table, uh, the first, uh, uh, even if it, it didn't learn S1, S2, S3, it, it still has a classification ability to do binary classification uh, or domain learning. Yeah, its generalization ability is very strong. So even if we don't get the correct domain identification, we still can perform a uh, right prediction. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that, that's cool. 
running independently and uh, the greater generalization ability gave us the best uh, set of other results. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Go ahead, Vincesna. Yeah, so I have like a follow up questions with respect to what Ali mentioned, because uh, I was curious, uh, you compared uh, this uh, new method with uh, Ditox and uh, learning to prompt. I mean, those were the two main, let's say, baselines related to uh, methodologies that were already, already using prompts, right? Uh, the, those two mostly. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah. Or there is a third? Okay. And so those, uh, uh, let's say, prompt uh, continual learning methods uh, uh, were using the same pre-trained uh, models or uh, they were using a different one? Um, and which of those yes, two, yeah. for example, right? So that, that, that's, I think, is a relevant question, right? To really understand if the methodology you are proposing um, uh, somehow is giving, like, you know, a strong advantage, maybe on domain incremental learning, because I think those other methods were tested in a class incremental uh, learning setting. Or, yeah. or it is mostly, you know, the advantage that you, you you underline here is mostly based on the quality of those uh, transformer-based, let's say, uh, models that you have used. Yeah, I understand. Um, in our own main experiments, we can we use the same VIT, uh, same VIT-based uh, model. Uh, you you can see all these methods with at least here. We change to the pre-trained VIT based model, and uh, for these methods are all for class incremental. Uh, that that's an important question uh, problem. Uh, that's because of previous methods are mainly focused on class incremental. When we find the two relative methods, we all these methods are class incremental. We have to apply these methods to domain incremental. Uh, apart from the L two P, L two P can really do domain group learning, but uh, the other methods only to class in learning. So we are the few works try to solve the domain group learning. And, uh, and we also apply a clip-based model. That, that's because that uh, we we first apply the domain, uh, the variety-based model, and we get the good performances of uh, compared with the other methods, and we further apply clip model to get more generalization ability to improve our performances. So you can see all our clip based models outperforms the other methods, and all the methods are used pre-trained VIT, the, the same pre-trained model, the same pre-trained VIT based model. And the only difference is that uh, the, the SLI prompts we use the clip based model. You can say uh, our our VIT based methods are all outperforms the other methods. So, so the tip is just uh, uh, improvements, but uh, the most important is that uh, the separation of learning deep independently. Yeah, that, that's all. Great. Yeah, thank you for answering the questions and thank you for the talk. Um, I think we can uh, formally uh, thank you now and you can either stay on until the end when we have general discussion or I know it's late there so don't feel like you have to stay on if you don't want to but everybody thank you again Yavin and uh, Ali okay, if you want to go ahead and set up please and, do. Uh, okay great. Let me close my yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. I'll give you can a you quick intro. Yes, yeah, we can see it. Okay. Um, so now we'll be transitioning from uh, you know these new prompting continual learning methods into a few shot, few shot robotics paper, um, also from NERBS 2022. So uh, we have Ali Ayub from a postdoc at the University of Waterloo. I'm very excited to hear about this paper as well. Continue our theme today. So uh, go ahead. And you're muted. 
Yeah, it's always, it's always the case every single time. Yeah, it's always. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, great. Thanks. So, thanks for inviting me uh, for the talk here, James. Um, and a nice short intro. Okay, great. So yes, uh, the paper that I'm going to present today, it's, uh, as Jamie mentioned, said, uh, was accepted in New York's 2022. It's about, uh, the title is Fushot Continual Active Learning uh, by a Robot. Okay, I okay. I feel like I don't need to, need to <laughs> describe this part over here, because I think every paper will do that, but I'll still do it uh, quickly. Um, yes, so continual learning, as we all are here for this, um, uh, the main goal is to develop models that can continue to uh, learn and have more knowledge over time, be able to adapt quickly to their environments um, so that they're better uh, or become more knowledgeable and better at learning over time, uh, hopefully like we humans do. Um, and it has a lot of applications, particularly for robotics uh, applications, where, which I'm focused on, especially for this paper. Uh, the goal would be to be able to adapt quickly with perhaps limited um, information and limited data uh, available. Um, yes, and then again, the catastrophic forgetting problem, I, I won't go into too much detail about it, So, but we all know that it's like uh, one of the main problems uh, in continual learning um, and most of the research still to this data is focused on uh, mitigating this uh, problem uh, where your model continues to forget previous knowledge and then when it, whenever it's learning anything new. Um, Okay, so this is where actually the main part of the paper comes in. Um, yes, so as I mentioned for robotics application in the real world, um, they might have to learn from interaction with their users. Um, and those users might not provide a large amount of data to the robot. So essentially these systems will have to be able to learn with a small amount of uh, labeled data. So let's just consider the object classification phase, which would be the main goal of this paper. Um, so, um, in the real world, however, um, the robots do have a lot, lot of unlabeled data available in their environment. So if the robot is operating, say, in a household environment, there might be a lot of unlabeled data. Um, so then one thing that could be done that is that, um, uh, the robot could focus on getting the label, uh, again, sticking with the object classification case. Uh, labels for the most informative sample. So essentially the goal of active learning in uh, the machine learning research. So where you have a learner, um, it selects the most informative sample, which is probably smaller than the big unlabeled data pool, and then asks it to be uh, labeled from its human user. Um, however, most active learning research is still focused still on the, uh, in the batch learning case, uh, where the continual learning uh, is not really happening, or at least it's done using complete replay. Um, and then the overall setup of a batch learning, a general uh, batch, uh, active learning setup would be kind of like this. You have like uh, initial training data set with say, uh, you can divide it into say known classes and unknown classes, and then you can train your model so that it can predict um, the known classes and perhaps a single neuron to predict if the newly encountered data is from an unknown class. Um, uh, I mean, I believe there are other models better than this a little bit as well uh, for active learning. Uh, but again, main goal has still been on uh, batch learning. Um, one issue with this kind of approach when you're learning continually is that not only you'd have the catastrophic forgetting problem on the model itself, so the model could be forgetting previous object classes when it's learning new classes, uh, but also its notion of the unknown class um, or unknown data might also be forgotten because as your model learns continually, it's learning new instances that it never knew before. So those are unknown. And once you learn anything um, that was unknown before, now your notion of um, unknown might change or it might have to be updated, which would be another challenge for this kind of um, approach. So for this, I focus on then the few thoughts continual active learning problem. Um, so the main idea for this, uh, so the main, the way I would define this problem would be like, uh, so in each increment T, a continual learning model M gets mostly unlabeled data. So it doesn't have labels available. Um, and it could be a large data pool. And then it should choose uh, only a few most informative samples to be labeled using uh, an acquisition function, um, which takes the continual learning model um, as a prior 
um, and then the unlabeled data as an input. Um, and then uh, once the model does obtain the label uh, for these, uh, for the most important examples, it can then train on this um, newly labeled data pool uh, using, um, I guess, continual learning in this case. Um, and then one thing to notice is that there's, uh, unlike class incremental learning setups, there is a possibility that your new labels or new uh, images or new objects that you're getting uh, labels for, they could belong to classes that you learned before. So there's no clear separation between uh, classes to be learned in separate increments. Um, and the whole idea is kind of like this. You have your model uh, uh, learning label samples, and then your model is actually being used in that position function perhaps to help you uh, determine the most um, informative samples. And then your Oracle in this case would provide the label. So for this, um, I propose actually this complete model, which is based on um, a, a Gaussian mixture model and then some techniques for active um, sample selection. Uh, so it kind of combines ideas from uh, continual learning with um, active learning to propose this uh, complete model for a few shots, continual active learning. Uh, so I'll go over this model in detail slowly. Um, so the first, so one thing I should mention that um, it's possible to start with acquisition function because acquisition function is using the model and then, um, or you can start with the model itself and assume that you have labeled data. So I'm starting with the model and assuming that the label, the data that is obtaining the model is currently labeled. And it will go back to the acquisition function to see um, how to get the labels uh, using the uh, model itself. Uh, so for the uh, continual learning model, the main uh, part of this is a uh, Gaussian mixture model. Uh, so I call it GMM-based continual learning. Uh, the main idea is that uh, to represent each uh, object class using a uniform Gaussian mixture model um, and uh, to continue to update this GMM uh, whenever you get a label sample of belonging to a particular class, uh, you can uh, either create a new uh, mixture component for that class uh, using the new feature vector. Uh, so in this case, um, uh, just the feature vector will be the mean of the distribution, Gaussian distribution and the zero covariance matrix. Uh, or you can update a previous uh, distribution um, within the Gaussian mixture model of the same class. Um, and I won't go into much uh, detail. I can actually give you an example of that. Um, so imagine this is like the initial uh, distri one distribution, very simple uh, start for a class. Um, and then you get some new data, which could be represented still using this distribution. So you simply update the uh, same distribution using the new data. Um, and then you can continue to do that as long as your new data can be represented or uh, at least is close enough to this uh, previous distribution. However, when you get new data uh, that might be too far from the previous distribution and could not be represented well with the distribution, you can uh, create a separate mixture component. So essentially a new Gaussian distribution for the new data. And then this can continue to happen over time. Um, if you continue to add more mixture components whenever needed in this class, uh, whenever you get the new data. Um, and the process is done through using a probability threshold, which is a hyperparameter. I can talk about it uh, more in Q&A if you have any questions. Uh, okay, great. So um, one thing you can do is that you can use directly these, Ga these Gaussian mixture models for classification as well. Um, however, that process is um, quite slow on test time uh, because finding the probability using GMMs on a very high dimensional space could be slow. And especially when you have a lot of distributions uh, so instead, um, I train actually a simple linear classifier. Um, uh, it's like a one layer neural network classifier. Uh, and then for this, uh, I train in it using the data that is available in the current increment. So the labeled feature vectors um, and also uh, the pseudo samples from the previous uh, classes. These pseudo samples are generated simply by uh, sampling the Gaussian distribution of the previous classes. Um, and you can also maintain, uh, you can also deal with class imbalance using this uh, approach uh, so that you can uh, sample similar amount of, uh, similar number of samples for uh, for all the previous classes. Uh, so this is kind of an example on the MNIST data set. Uh, for example, this is the original feature space. Um, and then this is a different number of uh, clusters. Uh, so different number of uh, Gaussian distribution. Um, and as you can see, like even when you have small number of Gaussian distribution to represent the uh, same features, uh, you can pretty much generate the same feature space uh, pretty effectively, um, which can then help with uh, avoiding the forgetting problem um, in the classifier. 
Okay, so that was kind of more about the model itself, how to continue to learn classes and then how they can be classified. So now I'll go back to the acquisition function and how to use them uh, to actually find the most informative examples in a single increment. Um, so for this, um, I use a combination of two techniques, the entropy-based sampling and viewpoint consistency. Uh, the idea of entropy-based sampling is pretty simple, which is that um, if your new data point, which is unlabeled, um, it's probably to belong to any of the previous Gaussian mixture models is very low. Its entropy would be very high, and therefore it might not be well uh, learned by the model and therefore should have a high score to be learned. Um, for the viewpoint consistency, the idea is that um, if you have uh, object um, images taken from different angles for the same object. Um, and if your model is providing similar labels for that uh, object, um, then it, it is probably known by the model before and then there should have a low score. But if there is an inconsistency between the labels, uh, then the object might not be, uh, or might be something worth uh, learning, uh, or might be not known by the model and therefore the model should focus on learning that particular object. Uh, so I could use a combination of these two techniques, the entropy and viewpoint consistency using another hyperparameter, uh, delta, um, um, to find a good balance between the two techniques. Um, okay, and then for testing, I tested the approach on 450 data set. Uh, so I checked to kind of adapt this. Uh, so it has 400 training object instances in 450. Um, uh, uh, and then what I did was like in each increment, uh, randomly sample five um, unlabeled objects, uh, videos, uh, and then use the acquisition function to get the label for only one sample at a time. So your model is learning one um, object video at a time. So essentially, it would take 400 um, increments to learn the whole, um, learn over the whole data set. Um, and then for evaluation, I use test accuracy on the complete test set in each increment. Uh, so essentially, the model is tested on all 150 test videos, I believe. Um, in the core for data set. Um, and I also check the uh, learning efficiency of these models to just to see like how quickly can they learn all the classes in the data set. Um, for this, um, there was no technique that I could find which was designed specifically for vocal. Uh, so I had to adapt the current continual learning approaches a little bit uh, using adding like a active learning component on top of that. Uh, mostly I use uh, simple soft max based uh, uncertainty sampling or uh, if they had centroids then I could use the distance um, from the centroids for that. But I can talk about it again if you have any more questions. Um, yes, yeah, so these are some of the results on 450. Um, as you can see, I'm mean, only showing for 70 increments. Uh, as you can see, the all accuracies are starting to saturate and it does saturate pretty quickly afterward. Um, but for initially, as you can see, like the, um, the GB cell approach, which is red, um, it's actually producing pretty good accuracy as compared to the green, which is the view shot learning baseline, which is the bachelor learning baseline approach, um, showing that it is able to avoid this forgetting and also be able to learn these um, classes pretty quickly. Um, and uh, in terms of learning efficiency, GBC actually learned the 10 classes within 15 increments, which means it is focusing really on learning the most informative, in this case, the most unknown classes. Therefore, it, it tries to learn these um, new classes as early as possible compared to other approaches. And uh, I did actually perform the experiments with a pepper robot in a real lab environment. It had like four different uh, places where I set up uh, different objects. So this is kind of an example of that. Um, very, I used 240 different household objects belonging to 20 classes placed at five different locations. Sorry, I said four. Um, and uh, for this, I manually moved the robot for this kit because the goal was not to uh, do an autonomous movement for the robot itself. Um, so every, uh, so you take the robot to a place and the robot can choose to kind of say, okay, I need to learn this particular object based on, uh, well, after getting the images and doing the model itself. Um, and then um, after learning, I did uh, actually, uh, so I actually did capture the data set itself and saved it. So it's available and released as a part of this paper. So if anyone is interested, they can have a look at that. Um, and then uh, uh, I also kept 60 objects separately for the test set, which were different from the one used in the training set. Uh, the results on Pepper data set were actually quite the same, pretty much almost the same as uh, on Core 50. So you see like the FLB orange and blue GBCL following kind of the same trend and saturating eventually. 
Um, and then other approaches are following a similar trend that we saw earlier. Um, same uh, stuff here in terms of number of classes. So all the classes that are in the first few increments, uh, so first 80 increments, and then the rest of them are just uh, not really adding anything new, which means that the accuracy doesn't improve as much either. It's, it's saturated pretty quickly. It shows that the model is able to quickly adapt to these environments. Uh, so yeah, in conclusion, um, so we presented an approach for uh, like a novel, pro uh, novel problem, focal uh, results on benchmark data sets and on a robot demonstrate the effectiveness of our approach for this uh, particular problem. Uh, and we also released a data set collected by the Pepper robot as a benchmark for future evaluations of focal methods. Um, in terms of limitations, uh, we did assume that the correct label would be provided and, a, and in a very nice fashion by the human users. Uh, I didn't perform an experiment with the actual human participants, so I was the one who was interacting with the robot. And finally, one thing was also to use a fixed feature effector and a fixed object effector um, in this case. Um, however, getting uh, improving the feature extractor part of the power that would be the next goal of this uh, work. All right, thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, thank you. That was a great talk. And now we will have time uh, for questions. So just like before, um, you know, raise your hand and you can go ahead and ask. Um, anybody have questions? Oh, Martin, Martin's gonna, okay. I have a question, sorry, how was I muting myself? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, if I understood it uh, correctly, then your model basically has a fixed feature extractor, right? Yes. yes. It has a fixed feature extractor and then you're basically fitting a Gaussian mixture model on top, right? Yes, exactly, yeah, it does have a feature, so feature extractor. So have you, yeah. So this, this sounds pretty familiar or related to basically variational autoencoder based approaches that you could argue are also kind of a Gaussian mixture, uh, except for like end to end trained with the black box feature extractor. And you could do mm -hmm. rather similar things. Um, have you given this consideration and like, do you have an idea of why your method is or where your method kind of outshines this or what the faults would be? Sure, thanks. That's a very good question. Um, for the VAE, um, well, the first thing is that you're trying to model your data into a single Gaussian distribution. Uh, for, I guess, at, at least a general VAE, um, you could probably create a Gaussian mixture model there. Um, uh, in terms of, so that's one of the main differences I would say, um, because I'm creating actually a separate GMM for each class. Uh, so it's actually a lot more flexible than your variational algorithm quarter where it has to kind of bring this data back into perhaps either a single distribution, a single Gaussian distribution, or um, I guess even a GMM, if you do create a GMM. Um, yeah, so that's, I would say, the main difference. Um, in terms of using them, are you saying that we should, so let me just clarify one more thing. Um, so are you saying like, is there a, feature extractor already available for the variational autoencoder or are you learning the feature representation as a part of the VA? The latter and specifically, I guess that there were some papers, not mine by the way, that have done things like uh, do a specific, like a class specific or time specific prior that puts it into like a specific part of latent space over time, right? These kind of things, um, but usually jointly trained with the encoder, yes. Yeah. Um... I mean, actually, one of my previous works was on that. Um, it was actually auto encoder based approach. Uh, it's the e, it's called EEC. Um, again, the issue over there is that, like, um, well, first, like, even if you do train your auto encoder, how are we classifying and how are we dealing with forgetting in that particular area? So that's like uh, the the problems still remain there. Um, even if we do use an auto encoder, same kind of problem. Um, and then you also have the deal with the issue of uh, training the autoencoder with very small number of samples, because in this case, I'm using like a single object video at a time, um, which is which is going to be an issue when training. And I mean, yeah. Which is going to be hard to get, get the, pro like, are you saying it's basically in the future setting going to be really hard to update the probabilistic encoder and the VAE? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That makes yeah. sense. That, I mean, I did try that actually <laughs> um, for my previous approach on EEC, but yeah, it was, it was hard. <laughs> Yeah. Of course, you could also uh, do meta learning. Thanks. Oh, yeah. Thanks. That was helpful. 
Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I think we have cha we have maybe time for one more question if somebody has one. Um, and maybe uh, Typhon, you could go ahead and start sharing your screen. Uh, I can stop sharing. Them. Zoom views. Ah, there he is. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we'll have more questions in the general discussion, but since it's, uh, I think, time, we can go ahead and move on and then come back to that. Um, so yeah, there he is. Good morning, Zyfang. Sorry, I think it's like, uh, Good morning. what was it, 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. your time? <laughs> yeah, it's almost 8. Okay, okay, it's good now. <laughs> yeah. So I know many in our field don't want to start a meeting at 7 a.m., so thank you for being flexible with your time as well. Yeah, no problem. Great. I'll go and give you a brief introduction, everybody. This is uh, Zaifeng Wang. He's a, I know you're a PhD senior student, maybe even close to the end by now at uh, Northeastern University. I know you've worked with uh, Google on many of your papers, um, and this is your NURPS paper, and I'll, I guess I'll let you read the title for your sake. But thank you for uh, joining us today, and this will be a great way to finish off, uh, finish off the seminar. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, thank you guys for the yeah previous great talks, and uh, uh, thank you that I have a chance to be here to share our paper, uh, Sparkle, uh, Sparse Continuing Learning on the Edge, uh, which is published on Europe's uh, 2022. Um, okay, so I guess I yeah I just go over the uh, brief introduction of continuing continuing learning again. Um, so basically, in continuing learning, we would like to maintain a single model uh, on a sequence of tasks. And uh, just as shown on the uh, figure, uh, what is like different from uh, the traditional um, IID learnings that we have like a, uh, like a time access and we uh, the, the tasks just come uh, one by one. And at, at any time point, we only have access to the, the current task so that we have the um, so-called catastrophic forgetting problem that once we have learned a task, uh, the model tends to forget what's learned about previous tasks. So um, basically a lot of like mainstream solutions, just trying to uh, solve the uh, catastrophic forgetting problem, uh, including regularization based method, uh, which constrains uh, important parameters from updating and their rehearsal based method, which maintains like a buffered uh, a small buffer trying to uh, save previous data from uh, past tasks. And there are also architecture-based method uh, that tries to maintain different task specific components for different uh, tasks so that the parameters uh, would like, uh, would not like interfere, uh, interfere with each other uh, when, when, when they're being updated. Uh, however, most of these methods just maintain a, a dense model uh, with potentially growing parameters. And uh, most importantly, uh, and most of the work did not discuss uh, efficiency, which is a very important factor uh, in real world. So uh, actually here's our motivation uh, of the work. That is uh, in practice, we always would like to apply continued learning technique on some resource limited applications. Uh, for example, in real world, we have our um, mobile phone, we have our uh, like, uh, like wearable devices, those are edge devices or uh, embedded systems, and they have like a, uh, some uh, inherent uh, feature that we need to uh, deal with. For example, they have limited, very limited memory and um, uh, limited computation power. And sometimes we need to uh, de deploy some of the um, continued learning algorithms on them, uh, uh, like with real time efficiency. Uh, and uh, and another problem is that when we like uh, when we, we like to pursue efficiency, we always like uh, suffer from like performance drop. So how to balance the uh, efficiency uh, performance trade off uh, is kind of like a, a great problem as well. So in our paper, we try to come up with a general framework for cost effective continued learning uh, with the idea of uh, sparsity. So here are several highlights of our work. So first of all, uh, our work is kind of 
like a synergy of three uh, different aspects. So basically, we we leveraged weight sparsity, uh, data efficiency, and as well as gradient sparsity together to achieve the uh, overall acceleration. Uh, so beyond like uh, just in pursuit of efficiency, our method can actually uh, give the whole model like a, like a better prediction accuracy. So our in our experiments, our our model can. Uh, lead to like uh, at most like 23 times less training flops as well as like an 1.7% uh, uh, improvement over uh, state-of-the-art accuracy. And uh, uh, interestingly, we, we have actually our uh, implemented our uh, method on like a real uh, real world mobile uh, edge device. So it's actually like a, a Samsung mobile phone. Uh, we can achieve at most like uh, 3.1 uh, times training uh, acceleration. Uh, on it. Um, okay, so let's get started with our uh, uh, actual method. So basically, this is the first part of our method called uh, task-aware uh, dynamic masking. So basically, the, the idea of the uh, masking is, uh, is, is very simple. We kind of maintain a binary mask uh, so that only like uh, one minus s uh, percent of the uh, the waves are actually valid, and the uh, other sides are zeroed out. So S here is called the uh, uh, sparsity ratio, and uh, by maintaining this uh, dynamic masking uh, system, we kind of dynamically update the sparse structure at every like fixed epoch intervals uh, when we're doing the the continuous learning process. And actually, we have two different. Uh, updating um, strategies because we're doing continuous learning. We uh, we have different tasks uh, given the uh, most like uh, like classic uh, classical class incremental learning problem. Uh, we have like task uh, transitions, right? So basically, when we do uh, the inter task transition, we adopt the uh, expand and shrink strategy. So basically, we are starting from like a, uh, like randomly initialized. Uh, the the binary mask, and when when there's like a task transition, we add more capacities. The the green dots are uh, like randomly initialized weights that are free capacity to learn the uh, new coming task. And after learn the task uh, for a few epochs, uh, we we kind of assume that the model has like transitioned into like a stable uh, phase. So uh, at this time we do the shrink strategy. So we kind of remove the the least important ways. So we'll go to the uh, the definition of importance later on. So basically, by doing this expand and shrink, we're kind of hosting a new uh, task. And here's like a second strategy that is the uh, intra task strategy. So basically, when we are uh, learning like a single task, we would like our uh, we would like our um, dynamic uh, the the uh, binary uh, mask to uh, to be updated like in a dynamic way. So basically. Uh, for like uh, every few uh, epochs, we we'll just remove the uh, least important uh, ways and trying to add add back some of the um, um, like random initialized initialized ways as uh, free capacity uh, to to kind of uh, adjust the uh, structure of the uh, uh, binary mask uh, in a subtle way. So basically, we're we're trying to uh, like. Uh, adjust the, uh, uh, the the topology of the binary mask uh, in every single task. So this is called the shrink and expand strategy. So basically, how how should we define the uh, the weight importance uh, in our continuous learning um, uh, task? So basically, the the uh, weight importance is composed like of uh, three different components. So basically, the first one is the the weight magnitude, which is intuitive because uh, once your your weight has like a large magnitude, removing it will or or add it back will uh, kind of influence your uh, final prediction result a lot. And also, we have included the um, the gradient uh, of the weights respect to the the current data as well as the the buffer data, which are also very intuitive as well because uh, it kind of me measures the uh, importance of the current weights uh, with respect to your current task and past task. So basically, adding the three parts uh, together measures the the uh, the importance of uh, of a weight. Okay, so let's go to the second part of our uh, method or framework, 
So basically, the second part is called the uh, dynamic data removal strategy, which is a very simple, intuitive uh, strategy as well. Uh, so basically, in usual um, IID training, like at, at every epoch, although we have like uh, like random batches and different orders of the batches, uh, we we can't we we actually uh, train on the same set of like the same number of um, examples every epoch. But in our dynamic data removal strategy, we kind of trying to remove easier examples along the way where we're learning the, uh, in the in the continued learning tasks. Uh, so basically for, uh, so this strategy is actually uh, synced with the, uh, the, 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 the very first TDM strategy. So for at every, uh, like for example, five epochs, uh, we, we, we just keep only the, the hardest one minus row uh, percent examples from the training set uh, from our current task. So basically we're doing this based on the hardness of the uh, uh, the images or the examples we are, we're, we're trying to learn. And how should we um, kind of uh, define the, the hardness? We, we kind of define the hardness based on the misclassification rate. So for example, for every epoch, we're just trying to uh, figure out for every image, uh, how many times we, we actually uh, misclassified it as like another example. So basically for, for, all, for, for those images that we always like, our model can always get it correct. We just remove it, simply remove it. So by this uh, simple strategy, we kind of reduce the uh, training examples like for, for every certain epochs. So that overall we, we, get, uh, we, we can like train our model uh, in a faster way. And somehow this uh, simple and effective strategy uh, actually combats forgetting in a sense that uh, it, it actually balances current data and past data in the buffer because in continued learning, uh, we always have like much more data in the uh, current data stream uh, versus the like limited size buffer. So by this kind of removing example, we actually balances the uh, two data streams. Uh, and another thing is that when we try to remove um, the, the easy to learn examples during the, the way, we, we kind of uh, maintain more like, like uh, that there's like harder data uh, in, in, uh, in, the training, in the training process. So that the harder data has like greater probability to be uh, sampled in the buffer. So that the buffer itself is more uh, representative when you use it in later tasks. All right. So yeah, let's come to the, the final component uh, of our uh, uh, method. So this dynamic gradient masking is actually a, uh, a second um, uh, sparse matrix, uh, like on top of the, the very first uh, sparse matrix. So uh, know that our, our weight uh, like is already uh, like very sparse. So basically we, we just keep only the most one minus S. So S is the, the very first uh, sparsity ratio on the, the weights. So Q here is like another sparsity rate uh, on, the, um, uh, on the gradients. So we'll just keep the, the most like important weights. And uh, the, uh, the strategy is synced with uh, the, the very first TDM as well. So basically the idea is, uh, is very similar to the way that we maintain important weights. We just like, we, we like to uh, like preserve, uh, like trying to update the most important weights and the weight, uh, the uh, importance of the weights like definition is as follows. It's very uh, close to the, the way that we uh, define the importance of the weights. Uh, and how, how is this strategy like uh, related to catastrophic forgetting? So actually this strategy is like uh, implicitly very useful for uh, reduced forgetting as well, because we are only updating like like a, uh, a like a proportion of the weights instead of updating uh, them all. So we're trying to, uh, in a sense, preserve past knowledge by zeroing out uh, some of the gradients. All right. So basically, here's like an overview of the uh, Sparkle method. Basically, we're trying to solve the problem uh, of uh, efficient continuing through weight sparsity, data efficiency, as well as uh, gradient sparsity. So note that we would like to present our method as like a, a general framework. So that every component, uh, there, there's kind of room for uh, improvement for every component because for now there, uh, I think it's very simple and we can design more uh, fancy technologies to, 
to achieve like uh like each component for example for data efficiency we can we can we can always do some like uh like fancy bayesian core set thing or uh whichever uh like novel strategies for uh selecting representative data as well as for weight and gradient part um okay so here comes our uh, experimental result uh we tried to uh, implement our sparkle strategy on top of the um uh, representative dark experience replay uh, method, uh, which is very uh, representative method in uh, continuous learning. And uh, we can, so, so here 75, 90 and 95 are uh, the sparse ratios. The, the higher uh, the, the sparse ratio, the sparse are our, our weight matrix is. So basically 95 meaning that we only have 5% of uh, learnable weights that are non-zero. Uh, so we can see that we, we uh, at like sparse ratio of 75 and 90, we already got like higher accuracy than the uh, DER. And also if you look at the, uh, the, the yellow curve, we can see that they're, they represent the training flops, which is a measurement of the uh, training efficiency. So we can see that we got like a much less uh, training flops there and even lesser when we got like a very sparse uh, neural network here. Okay, here's like, uh, like a more formal or uh, detailed uh, com comparison between our method and the uh, uh, representative continuous methods. Again, we got like better accuracy and much much less uh, training flops. And also, we also try to um, compare our method uh, with the uh, existing uh, sparse uh, sparse training method by combining them with uh, a DER plus plus. So basically, we we again like get better accuracy and uh, much less training flops. And uh, and this figure is quite interesting because this is actually we um, we implement our method uh, on uh, like a real uh, world mobile device, uh, which includes some like compiler level optimization for uh, uh, sparse sparse uh, calculation. So basically, uh, in this figure. Uh, the, the y-axis means uh, acceleration rate, uh, uh, like with respect to the, the, the basic DER method. And the x-axis is actually the, uh, the final uh, prediction accuracy. So basically, our method can actually uh, like excel at like both aspects uh, in this figure. All right. So let's come to the final summary and conclusion. So basically, our... Sparkle method is a general framework that introduces cost-effective continuous learning on the edge devices. Uh, basically, it outperforms state-of-the-art methods in, in terms of both training flops, which is the efficiency, as well as accuracy. So here's actually like, uh, uh, there's like a very interesting uh, uh, like open research question is that how, how can we actually leverage uh, sparsity in our model uh, to improve um, continuous learning performance. I mean, in addition to the, the training efficiency. Uh, and also uh, like a very important thing is that we um, try to implement Sparkle on like a real world edge device and achieve a great acceleration rate, rate. And we hope that this could be like a starting point that we kind of uh, like explore more exciting uh, novel continuous learning methods for real world uh, edge devices where uh, the computation and uh, memory are limited. And also our code is available here, either by visiting the link or scan the QR code. And feel free to use our code in your uh, future research. All right, thank you very much. That will be all for my sharing today. Thank you, thank you so much for that wonderful paper. Um, and anybody, if you have questions, I see I oh, know that's a that's an applause from Ali. If you have questions, feel free to raise your hand, unmute, turn your camera on, and uh, and ask now. I'll I'll open one up um, real quick, and then I'll let all you go. Um, uh, just a question: I may have missed this, and I apologize if I did. Um, your training flops does that include like like end to end the entire calculation of all of which things to all the gradients and everything, which which modules are supposed to be you know dropped or not? Is that is that you know, end to end, I started my training and finished my training, everything captured in there. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, exactly. And is uh, what about uh, inference? Is inference 
uh, faster than others or about the same? Or did y'all measure that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So actually, we, we got like faster inference as well. So that's basically uh, so. very same. Yeah, about the same. Yeah. You should, you should highlight that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay um, yeah. Ali, I think you were next. Thanks, Luke. Um, yeah, thanks, Ethan, for the nice talk. Um, I just have a very quick question. You might have mentioned it already. Uh, for uh, When you're doing the uh, gradient map, sorry, the weight masking using mm -hmm. the binary mask yep. and expand and shrink part. Uh, yeah, this one. Perfect. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so for the blue weights, uh, essentially, that are for the previous task, mm -hmm. um, are they fixed when you're doing training on your new data? So like, mm -hmm. for example, once you are done with expand, expansion and shrink, shrinking, are you only updating the green weights that are for that you're just recruiting for the new task? And are you keeping the blue ones fixed? Well, yeah, that's a great question, actually. So, so basically, we're not like fixing any parts of the 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 binary mask. So basically, every parts could be the like least important ones once you incorporate the the, the green ones. So we're not like fixing it after we learn the uh, the binary structure on the previous task. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Um, and just another quick uh, another quick question would be. Um, for your uh, tasks, you're, are you using just uh, like a ResNet model? Because I didn't think you, I don't know if you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah uh, sure. Kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your... Yeah, it's ResNet. So basically, okay. we're, yeah, we have the details in our in our paper. Okay. And um, are you also doing the the same weight sparsity and everything on the CNN part of that too? Or are you just doing it in the fully connected layers? Um, in your in your model, yeah, yeah. So so we actually do it on the CM part as well, and and we have actually uh, uh, we can actually borrow some ideas from the uh, the the uh, pruning papers. They have like uh, like regular and irregular pruning uh, strategies for how to like uh, prune the parameters of the uh, convolution channels. So basically, they have yeah yeah yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we have another one. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the nice talk. Yeah, the the Sparkle method is really interesting for on device continual learning. Yeah, I just to follow the comments of uh, discussion from you. So I just curious to, because there are a lot of the pruning or sparsity based pruning uh, neural network based uh, methods. So mm -hmm. I just curious. To, how uh, can we further apply this kind of methods to continual learning or continual neural learning, neural learning, continual learning neural networks? And do you have any comments on this regard? Yeah, so basically, uh, yeah, that's a very nice comment. So basically we actually, we have already seen like a lot of uh, like pruning based continual learning methods. Like uh, uh, I, I, I actually can name some, uh, uh, for example, the the packnet, and yeah, I, I mean they're like a line of work. So basically, the idea is that trying to uh, prune the network into like different uh, like partitions, so that each partition corresponds to like a single task, so that they the the parameters are like not interfere like with each other. So that's the basic idea of how you apply pruning uh, to continue learning. Uh, but actually, our work. Uh, it's kind of different from from theirs uh, in the sense that we maintain like a very sparse network along the way. When you add more tasks, uh, our sparsity ratio will not change in some sense. Uh, so basically, we, our actual um, uh, like training efficiency and inference efficiency is, is way uh, higher than those like uh, pruning based methods because for those pruning based methods, although you kind of partition your network into uh, like sparse components, all, all the like superpositions of the uh, subcomponents together will be that like the whole model. You're still applying the, the like the full dense model. So basically, that's the difference. Um, so I, I I think the um, one way that uh, that I can imagine our method to be more like practical is that how can we dynamically change the uh, 
sparse ratio when we have more and more and more data coming in. For example, we have like, uh, so, so for now we're just like trying now like 10 or 20 tasks, but if we have like, like 10 times or 20 times of the tasks, how can we actually add the, um, at minimal uh, capacity to host the common examples, but still maintain our sparse ratio at very uh, like high level. For example, we can still only use like 10% of the, uh, uh, the parameters to host like uh, more and more tasks. That would be very interesting. Like instead of like using up the whole uh, capacity of the, the network. Yeah, that's my yeah, own perspective of how to uh, proceed on this line of research. Cool. Thank you for the answer. Yeah, yeah no problem. Okay. Uh, I think at this point, uh, we can uh, wrap up the formal speakers part. I want to thank again all three of our speakers today. This is our first time starting in this format. I think it's been successful. We had a, a large number of people despite the small Zoom bug, which we'll fix for next time. Uh, so thank you all uh, for joining today. Um, reminder, uh, we are open for tweaking things in the future to better serve the general uh, community at large. So if you have feedback, whether that be about the format or whether that be about recommending papers or speakers that you want to hear from in the next session, please reach out. You can DM on Twitter, message on Slack, or send an email to us. Um, so I think now we'll turn the recording off.